Francisco, here in the Los Angeles branch, rule number one for a presenter or a speaker, never set your notes down. <laughs> I have no idea where I put them. Okay. All right, so welcome. Welcome to Closing the Health Wealth Gap, Strategies to Reduce Health Disparities and Create Financial Opportunity. We're glad that you're here. We will have more people coming in that are uh, finding a place to park. We'll go ahead and get started. What I'd like to do is, is talk to you a bit about why the Federal Reserve is involved in this, in this issue and also in this subject. And I want to also go over the agenda with you and we'll do a little bit of self-introductions and then I will be introducing the director, uh, the legislative director for the New American Foundation here in California and that's going to be in Calderon. And so we will get to that. So uh, first off, I want to tell you that I'm with the community development group which at the Federal Reserve and uh, I'm not seeing any heads turn on that one. Usually I do and hmm, that doesn't sound right. Federal Reserve, community development. Well, that's the group I'm with, and we're actually, the group is sitting with me. And we've been doing uh, community economic development for that long. And in fact, we've been doing it really in response to the 1977 Community Reinvestment Act. It took us a while to get our act involved, you know, in, in the game. But we've been doing this for a very long time, and we do it across the several strategies of community development. Typically, in our history, it's been uh, affordable housing, small business development, and job generation. And in the last several years, maybe the last five years, we've really come to understand that asset building, something that we've also been involved in, serves as a platform just like health and education. And everything we do seems to fall around that. So in terms of why is the Fed involved in this particular subject today, and we'll, I'll call it health for, for right now, in 2009 we began to take a look at the nexus of public health and community development finance. And we did that like we have done in those other strategies that I mentioned, like affordable housing. We, want, we always want to be part of the solution. So when we worked in 2009, we saw that public health in its 100-year history is very well developed and funded. And that the field of community economic development, because it's not quite grown up to be an industry yet, is rooted in the neighborhood, like where we perform. And that, but the problem is we're not very well organized. Okay, we're not very well organized. We do not have a common agreement or definite on definition, and we also have very little money comparatively to public health. Yet what we do have is the vision to see that public health is coming out of institutions and into the communities where we do our work. And we also have the insight to attract the best practitioners, academics, and funders with already established financing mechanisms to invest and lend to community development financial institutions, so like banks, where they don't take in deposits, and they do lending in low-wealth neighborhoods. And so what we can do then for nonprofits and community development financial institutions, and also for the banks in the room, is we can bring visibility to them as a means of assisting public health in accomplishing greater positive outcomes in unhealthy communities. Our role as an economic and community research institution, beyond being the driver of our national monetary policy, the manager of the U.S. financial system, the monitor of economic growth, and the supervisor of regulated depository financial institutions, beyond that, we have the power to convene and to publish and to produce what we see and what we learn from those that we work with, like you, and in the hundreds conversations that are going to take place until we finally get to a place where this mix of asset building policies and health is united. The upside is we have years ahead of us to do this work. The subject is highly controversial and critical to our nation. The downside is we have years ahead of us to do heavy work, to forge effective partnerships and collaborations, to fund and invest in communities. So, what I'm really saying, if I boil it down, is that we count on you to keep coming back to conversations like this, and it really helps me when I meet you again and again, and I hear you say, the Fed puts on really great topics, or really great subjects, and that's what brings me here, because we do that with partners all the time. Today, our partner is New America Foundation. So, we count on you to keep coming back, and for you to also 
when you're here, think about how this work can inform what you do or what your organization does. So for example, you have resources, you have services, and some of you have products. And so the question is, how can you better use those to enable low wealth and low income people to rise out of poverty sustainably, long-term change in their economic condition? So if you would today listen for that, listen for that opportunity, and you'll hear it from each of our great guests today. So that's a good segment. So let's take a look at the agenda. Let me pull that out. You can see that we're getting started just a bit late, which means that uh, you're going to have to talk fast at the break. You're probably going to shorten that a bit. But um, what we'll do then is um, Olivia will come up and she will make some comments, and then she's going to lead us into uh, the introduction to the moderator for the first panel. And they're going to discuss public policy strategies to this, um, to this subject, of the approach to this subject. And then following them, we'll take a small break. And then we're going to have Lisa Richter from uh, GPS Capital Partners, who will be taking us into the, uh, the private sector view uh, in supporting these initiatives. And you're more than likely, because there, uh, there's a, there are many, many, many speakers that are uh, able to speak to this topic. So when we bring them together, you're going to hear some a lot of different, perhaps, viewpoints of the same, uh, of somewhat the same uh, grand topic, if you will. So uh, then we will have uh, some closing uh, remarks. And so within each one of these panels, we'll have a little bit of time as well to, for any questions you might have. You'll see on the back of the agenda are the files. You get a sense of who's who. And before uh, I introduce uh, Olivia, what I would like to do is just ask you first, if you would, Raise your hand if you are from a public health agency or organization. Okay. If you are a nonprofit wealth builder, you work for an agency that does nonprofit wealth building. Okay. Good. If you are a community development financial institution, CDFI, in the room, Alice. Uh, or in any other industry intermediary that may not be a CDFI, any other nonprofits that are CDCs or any other nonprofits? No? Okay. Any foundations? Yeah, a few. Okay. And how about from the uh, world of academia? Right. Okay. So now we know who's in the room. So the challenge for you is that you have to today, this is the rule, you have to go up to three people and squint to try to read the name <laughs> across those fabulous names. Okay? All right, so that's your challenge. You've got to meet three. And uh, we could complicate it and say three people you don't know, but you don't have to do that, because you will uh, converse with three people. So I'd like to introduce you now to Olivia Calderon, the California Legislative Director of the New America Foundation. Olivia is based in Los Angeles and works in Sacramento as well. She helps California lawmakers hammer out laws to improve the welfare of California residents in a big way. In her role, she regularly testifies before the California State Legislature. She educates government officials and interest groups about asset accumulation, health care, education, and energy policies. She also develops related policy proposals, provides expert testimony on pending legislation, identifies partnerships to build broad policy coalitions to advance key policies, and manages the capital's first bipartisan educational asset policy forum, which she launched in August 2007. So I'm going to say in a nutshell that she has a very distinguished career. She's done a lot of things for a lot on a lot of issues, and you can see that in the brief um, in the brief bio. But for now, I give you a little excited to be here with you today. I, um, I remember uh, it was about a year ago in the same room when we were having a similar conversation. Um, the, the Federal Reserve of San Francisco um, had, uh, had uh, asset builders and practitioners, had folks from the financial industry, banks, folks in public health, talking about healthy communities. And, uh, and Dr. Tony, Tony Icon was talking about the social determinants of health. And he was challenging us to break out of our silos and to, and for asset builders, this is something that resonated with me, to understand that we have a place in healthcare reform. Um, he said that for those of us that are helping people permanently exit poverty and grow the middle class, we're practicing medicine. 
I was shocked. I couldn't wait to call my dad. My sister Vanessa is a doctor in New York City. She practices emergency medicine. And I was like, hey, dad, guess what? I'm, I'm doing something in health, too. Uh, <laughs> we're tackling poverty, and we're helping communities and individuals be healthy because of it. Um, and for those of you in the room who helped to uh, pass the ACA, the Affordable Health Care Act, and are now working to implement it, what you did was you provided a much-needed financial tool, access to health care coverage, and an array of opportunities um, to help families and communities get on a path to financial security, which is what we're going to be discussing today. Um, the first panel, of course, is going to explore the public policy piece of this. The second panel will talk about the private sector role. But clearly, our roles are is intimately intertwined. Um, and there are opportunities, and they're real, and the challenges are great. And so I'm thrilled to be here today, and I just want to thank again Melody Nava for helping me make this event happen, um, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco for hosting this conversation. And with that, because we need to get through this uh, in a short uh, amount of time, let's get started. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Shana Alex Lavadera. She's a professor at UCLA. Her bio is also included in your packet. But Dr. Levadera is a research scientist at UCLA at the Center for um, Health Policy Research. Her research focuses on discontinuous health insurance, particularly among low-income children and its impact on and access to care. Um, she received her master's degree in public policy at UCLA School of Public um, Affairs and her PhD in health services from UCLA School of Public Health. So with that, let's get started with the conversation. Dr. Levadera. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me over here, because if I go behind this podium, you sure won't be able to see me. Uh, I am so excited to be here. I really am. Uh, when I was asked to be the moderator for this panel, I jumped at the opportunity to just be in this room and be able to listen and to talk to all of you, because I really feel that this panel and this discussion is so important, and these partnerships that we're building are really what is going to be the building blocks for implementing the ACA for implementing all of the changes that are coming even earlier than 2014, um, which we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about, and as we move into the future and really building a better country for everybody at all ends of the income scale. So a little bit more about myself. Um, my master's in public policy is in both health policy and regional and urban planning. And I also have a bachelor's in political science. So you can see that those are kind of my building blocks. And then I started working at the Center for Health Policy Research out of my master's program with the State of Health Insurance in California project, which hopefully many of you are incredibly familiar with our humongous 100-page report that we've been putting out many times over the past decade. The new one is coming out soon, I promise. It's very, very soon. Um, and uh, I took over that project after receiving my PhD um, in health services. I realized health insurance and health policy is really where my passion is. I got my PhD in that and now I'm Director of Health Insurance Studies, and I get the opportunities to do things like this. So uh, that's about me. I can tell you that in my 12 years of working in this topic and doing all the research at both the national and the, the state levels in California with our California Health Interview Survey, what we've seen is that income is absolutely the driver when it comes to whether or not a person has health insurance. You can control for everything else. Racial and ethnic status, citizenship, control for citizenship, including undocumented, and yes, there is going to be some effect there, but income is much bigger. And it's not even just your own income. There are separate effects for your own income, your own wage, and what you get at your own job, and also your family's income, your household income. And so you can have two wage earners, and if they don't make enough income to get up out of that lowest income bracket, then actually you might be a little better off, because then you can get Medi-Cal if you have children. So it's that very, very low people that actually are getting some of the safety net. And then you get just a little bit above that, you make $11 an hour, and all of a sudden you're too rich for public coverage. I don't know if any of you have tried to live in Los Angeles at $11 an hour. I did right after college. It's not fun. <laughs> it's really not a good place to be. You feel like you're in poverty, and you really feel it at every level. And I didn't have kids then. I, I, my mind boggles that there are millions of people in this county alone who live at that income level with children and try and cover them with health insurance all the time. We're doing a really good job with kids because of public policies. We have almost, almost 100% coverage for kids. Very, very close. Our most recent data is from 2009, and from 07 to 09, when the economy tanked 
And unemployment went, let's not forget, from 5.5% in 2007 to 12.3% by 2009. An unprecedented double, over doubling of the unemployment rate in just that time period. Children's insurance coverage actually went up because of the public policies that were there. When their parents lost their jobs and their incomes went, hmm, public coverage stepped in and was able to cover those kids. Their parents weren't quite so lucky which is why we now have over 7 million uninsured in California alone. And na nationally, um, the newest figure is about 50 million uninsured. So income is absolutely part of the discussion. I also want to bring in the fact, um, something that I learned earlier this year, this year has kind of been my economic justice year. Um, I started off the year on a panel myself that was hosted by the Los Angeles Alliance for New Economy, which if you haven't heard of that group, Lane, I would recommend you look into that. They're doing a lot of good asset building work and community organizing work um, in Los Angeles with low income populations. They hosted a panel where they were talking about subcontracted workers of Los Angeles County. So these are people who had good government jobs that work in our hospitals here in Los Angeles, that work in our, our buildings, that, that are, are the people that are security guards for the courthouses. And looking at their training and, and also their health insurance. And they had me take a look at the numbers. And I took a look and I said, I'm shocked because your numbers among people who are insured, in terms of how much they still have in medical debt, in terms of how much they have in access to care, whether or not they can get the care they need, they're worse than the uninsured. And this is a population that was supposedly insured with good government jobs that are supposed to help people you know, lift out of poverty. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. And this panel is a good step to start talking about it. So I'm going to introduce the panel members. Um, what we're going to do for this discussion is go through each presentation back to back, and then at the end we'll take questions. So if you do have questions, and I'm sure you will, um, topics will come up, please write them down, and at the end I'll be moderating the discussion of questions, and, and we'll be able to talk to all of you, and if you still don't get them answered, well then we'll talk to all of you at the break and, and keep this going, you know, ongoing. But let me introduce our esteemed panelists at this point. Uh, our first panelist is Mark Bukovina. He is the executive director of the Access Project and himself has a long and distinguished career in this topic. He has been a long-term fighter just in getting the topic of medical debt on the agenda and among the insured and making sure that this topic gets put into surveys like ours, which did get added to 2007. We were a little late to the party, but at least it's there now. Uh, and it's talked about at the national and the statewide level. And he's going to be talking about what this issue is on kind of a broad macro level term and what are the possible public policy levers that can address you know, these problems and, and fix them. And then we will move on to Lee Paz, who is a senior fellow in the Health Policy Program at the New America Foundation. He has also been working uh, quite some time on this and has been leading a series of conversations in California about the ACA and how it will be implemented. And he's going to talk about the nuts and bolts of what's in the ACA, um, for those of you who might not be aware of the nuts and bolts, um, because it is a very complicated law, there's lots of moving parts, and then he'll also talk about how it specifically relates to this topic, because the ACA relates to a whole list of topics, and you can do an entire graduate level course on it, so we're going to focus in, in just seven like, minutes. in seven minutes, <laughs> there you go, you, you've got to work it out for you, in seven minutes you're going to talk about that. And then we'll move on, uh, Olivia, who has already been so ably introduced will talk to us about what is going on at the state level, specifically for California, and what we're doing as an independent actor, um, because California, as always, is a bellwether for the rest of the country, and we are moving full steam ahead and leading the way in terms of our policies here. And then finally, um, we will go down to the community level, and from a community organizing standpoint, we have Jose Quinon Quinones, I apologize if I messed up last name, um, who will be talking to us uh, from his community perspective. He's the executive director of the Mission Asset Fund, working in San Francisco <coughs> County to build assets for people in the Mission District um, who are low income. And he'll be speaking to us from that perspective and also introducing um, his, new, uh, his new project. I, I have to mention this because it, it, I'm, I'm so excited about hearing about this. The financial facts label and how you can bring um, something as complicated as financial facts to something that's easily understood by everyone. I would also like to say we have all ends of the uh, academic spectrum. We go from the East Coast to the West Coast here, and fellow Bruin Olivia, so yay, go Bruins. 
And I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. Thank you. Um, I may need some help here. Oh. <laughs> getting these slides. Please. Oh, just use that. So I want to thank uh, the Fed for hosting this meeting. It's great to have the Fed uh, convening on various topics and really appreciate the Fed uh, for doing so today, bringing together uh, these issues of, of health and wealth. And I also want to thank my colleagues at the New America Foundation for the opportunity to speak today and to, uh, to, to bring this issue of, of uh, medical debt and health care affordability into a discussion around, around health building. Uh, maybe I missed it, Melody, but are there bankers in the room? Okay, great. <laughs> Being an outsider to the financial service system, I wanted to ask that question because... Okay, <laughs> call maybe bankers <laughs> Other financial institutions represented? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I, my slides are in the packet. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over each of the slides, but what I'm hoping to do today is give some uh, some high-level data in terms of healthcare costs. And uh, I apologize to, to those in the room who are steeped in this issue. Talk about issues related to medical debt, and and then try to connect this issue of of health and wealth. And I'm hoping that at the end of the session today, those of you who are on the wealth side of, of the spectrum here, doing the work of financial services and around asset building for low and moderate income populations, you will understand not only the importance of health to that work, but get engaged and involved in work to implement the affordable care uh, that was mentioned previously. And for those on the on the health side, really think about how health in, influences wealth and, and the development of assets in, among low and, and moderate income populations. Uh, so, the, the health figures. In 2009, as a nation, we spent $2.5 trillion on health care, 17.6% of our gross domestic product. Um, and in spite of that, had nearly 50 million people uninsured. Shana mentioned um, the new census data came out, the numbers for 2010, 49.9 million uninsured people. That number would have been several million people higher if not for certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act that are already in place provisions that extend coverage to young adults, enabling them to buy coverage or buy into coverage under the parents' plan, broad coverage to estimated million young adults in the country, um, and there are other provisions as well. The projections, though, I want to call your attention to the projections on this, because in not too many years, it's projected that we'll be spending over four and a half trillion dollars on health care. Uh, nearly 20% of our GDP, it's estimated, that figure will represent. So we're seeing the uh, health care expenditures increased dramatically. Another way to talk about this is the effect that it has on families, and many of us in the room <coughs> may kind of know this intuitively, but this is a recent article from the journal Health Affairs, which looks at health insurance coverage uh, provided through employers for the typical family of four and other uh, information. So you see over a 10-year period, between 1999 and 2009, the adjusted for current dollars Median gross in household income for these this family for was seventy six thousand dollars. That grew to ninety nine thousand dollars in two thousand and nine. The portion of that being used to to pay for for health care in a variety of ways grew dramatically, much greater than the increase in those wages or that household income for those families. So you can see monthly out of pocket insurance premiums more than double. Out of pocket monthly. Uh, spending on health care nearly double. And then there was also a, a, a line in there for a portion of income for taxes paid for Medicare, for Medicare and other gov government sponsored program increased uh, probably corresponding with the increase in income. But the take home message here is that I mean health care is eating financial resources for us as a nation and for families that we're, we're working with and interested in, in uh, preserving and protecting the, the assets of their health care. If we were able to contain the health care costs at simply the rate of inflation, people would have had nearly five times as much money from that gain in their annual income than they had um, as a result of, of these increasing health care costs. So I thought that's an interesting um, uh, chart just showing the way in which these ever-increasing health care costs are, 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 are eating up family financial resources. Um, 
the Commonwealth Fund does a lot of surveying around uh, health insurance issues. And I also want to uh, thank Shana for both for being here today and the fine work that, that her center does on this. I think you're fortunate in California to have the resources of people like Shana and the center doing similar work to what uh, foundations like the Commonwealth and National. Um, you have other great foundations in the state as well, from the and others who do a lot of tracking and give you a lot of data to really to work on these issues. But in 2010, these are national data now, 73 million American adults, working age adults, adults under the age of 65, had medical bill problems, uh, this, these types of bill problems. Either unable to pay a medical bill, were contacted by a collection agency for medical bills that they had, said that they had to change their way of life in order to pay for health care expenses, or were left with medical debt. The number of people with medical debt nationally is about one in four. 44 million people said they had uh, medical bills that they were paying off over time for medical debt. Shane mentioned this earlier. Prior to the recession here in California, about 2.2 million residents in California had medical debt. So the number is, is uh, less than uh, the national figure, but still a disturbing percentage of people with, with medical debt. So here, kind of this health wealth nexus. Um, as Shana said, poverty drives health. Um, but the other thing that happens here, and I kind of want to flip that over, is health drives people further into poverty. <coughs> people further into poverty. So issues related to unaffordable health care costs take uh, a problem and amplify it even further. For, for everybody's at risk uh, here, but this problem falls disproportionately on, on low and moderate income populations. So what happens when people have medical bills um, that they're struggling to pay? Well, many of them can't pay for other basic expenses, food, housing, uh, heat, etc. But they also begin to deplete people's assets. That actually, that second bullet is incorrect. That's 29 million people who used up their savings to pay medical bills, not to go alone. So that's about 40% of the people with these billing problems exhausted their savings trying to pay the medical bills. One of the narratives out there in terms of people with medical debt is that there's scuffles. They're not paying for uh, their hospital care. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, zip through these slides. People take out loans against their homes, take out other sorts of loans to try to pay off these bills, um, or put it on credit cards. We was going to cover issues in the Affordable Care Act. That is a huge opportunity in terms of this health wealth connection and addressing uh, problems related to, to health and, and medical debt. I want to talk about something else uh, and the way in which medical bills are treated once people have bills that they can't pay. Uh, about 30 million Americans were contacted by collection agencies for medical bills in 2010. Studies done by the, published in the Federal Reserve Bulletin have found that more than half of accounts in collection are medical in nature. So what happens when people have these problems? These are major derogatory accounts. They go into the credit history section of a credit report, the most heavily weighted part of a credit report. Drives down people's credit scores, which increases the cost of accessing credit. So the, the, the wealth that people develop um, and the assets that people develop. And I would argue that a credit score is part of our asset, is, is an asset. Um, a credit score determines your ability to access credit and how much credit will cost. So it's very important. So what we see here is even very small dollar medical bills having a, a disproportionate effect on people's, on people's uh, ability to access affordable loans. Uh, I want to call your attention to the top bullet here, the National Foreclosure uh, Mitigation Counseling Program. About 6% of, of the clients served in that program cited medical debt as the primary, primary reason for their mortgage default. That was even greater than the people whose rates were adjusting on affordable rate, uh, adjustable rate mortgages, um, which was shocking to me to see that that figure was greater than, than the uh, rate of resets. Uh, okay, income drives this. Here's medical uh, debt or, or, or portion of these populations that 133% of poverty are below, uh, 133 percent of poverty are yeah. Nearly half of people living at or below 133% uh, of poverty are spending more than 10% of their income on, on health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs. Problems related to med medical bill, medical debt, but we can see the same distribution. Fortunately, the Affordable Care Act is going to address some of these issues. 
uh, there's going to be an expansion of Medicaid, Medicare, under the Affordable Care Act for people at under 30 percent poverty and, and below. I'm not going to go into the Affordable Care Act. I just want to move quickly to other things that um, can help to, to mitigate problems related to medical debt. I know we have some colleagues in the second panel who are going to be talking about some of these issues. Um, I want to talk about charity care standards and transparency and what can happen at the institutional level, at the state level, um, can be very important. How medical bills are treated, whether or not they're sent into the credit bureaus and on people's credit reports, very important to wealth building. Um, currently, once an account is sent to collection, irrespective of why it's sent to collection, and I'm sure if I had the time and we could do a brief poll here, people would have experiences of bills being sent to collection that they later pay, that they thought dealt with the problem of those bills having been sent to collection. Not true. Once a bill sent to collection is on your credit report, it can stay there for up to seven years, even if the balance due is zero. So there's some legislation in Congress, the Medical Debt Responsibility Act, which would require the move, removal of zero balance due accounts. So accounts that are either fully settled, because maybe somebody qualified for a charity care program, got some other assistance, or are fully paid by the, by the patient client, um, will be require the removal of those accounts within 45 days. It's really important because, again, those credit scores are assets, and those credit scores drive a lot of the, the wealth building work that, that is taking place, uh, and then many of you have been I apologize if I wasn't doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Look forward to further discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and I'm going to make one plug here even for a limited time. If you read nothing else in healthcare in the next couple of weeks, look at a report the California Healthcare Foundation came out with last week on the astonishing variation in elective surgical procedures in California, and you can draw your own conclusions <laughs> from that. And then finally, the limbs, as it were, I'm going to get to this at the end, are the many provisions in the ACA, far many that are thought of that attempt to improve prevention in public health. So taken as a whole, the ACA should greatly improve the financial security of low and middle income Californians. It will equalize access to quality affordable insurance coverage. And in fact, the point of the ACA, if there's one central point, is to try to bring, bring everybody up to the standard of employer coverage, which is still not necessarily great is at least a better floor. It will make it easier to avoid the medical debt problems which Mark has laid out and uh, lower the hassle of enrolling either in public programs or in private health coverage and also by giving individuals and communities the, the, the tools to reverse health disparities in their own neighborhoods. Two very quick slides just to, to recall why the Affordable Care Act was, was necessary. If you look here at the numbers to get the Commonwealth Fund survey, internationally, those who went without medical care because of costs, you can see that even those with relatively high incomes in the U.S. had this problem as much or more as low-income folks in other countries. And we can multiply this sort of data by a thousand times, and you've probably seen it. And if the Affordable Care Act hadn't been passed, we probably would have seen the jump of the uninsured to high 50s, mid 60 million. Uh, an increase in employer health spending by almost 100%. And uncompensated care costs, those that are you know, where, where folks go to the emergency room with hospitals and are paid for by charity care, again, about 100%. So it's, as you hear the debate over the Affordable Care Act, it's worth keeping that context in mind, what would have happened if we hadn't done it anyway. So the three pillars of the um, Affordable Care Act in terms of coverage, the first is the, is the large expansion of, of Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California. And I titled this Medicaid is Health Insurance, because what I mean by that is before, before this passage of the Act, Medicaid was still connected inexorably to its welfare roots. It was still categorical eligibility. Now it is a program or will be for anyone under 133% of poverty, still a very low level. But regardless of whether you're blind or disabled or have dependent children, or the way that Medicaid used to be. And as a, as a result of that, about 1.7 million low-income Californians are expected to gain coverage. There are different figures, but that's a good ballpark figure, and Shane may have others. Uh, one thing that's absolutely unique to California is this um, federal waiver that was received just before the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And as a result of that, there's 10 billion, a maximum of $10 billion coming to California to help fund um, <coughs> help fund up to a half a million Californians who already have, low-income Californians who already have coverage or who will gain coverage, and 57 of 58 California counties are signed up to participate in that. Um, there, there are, however, um, some big problems here. And the biggest is, as you all know, California is in a huge budget crunch. And where, in a budget crunch, where you look, you always look for Medi-Cal. 1.7 billion in cuts in the most recent budget, and there's very little low-hanging fruit in Medi-Cal. We already have the lowest per capita Medi Medicaid rates in the country, the lowest rates to providers. Um, we could try to move to managed care, but there's no certainty that will save money. Um, so the, the real concern here is that as the the, um, the breaks are being applied to the program and the accelerator for the, the expansion may be stuck. So one other, one other pillar of the Affordable Care Act is then to safe, uh, strengthen the safety net for folks who are still, not un still uninsured um, after the uh, act is passed. And in California, as you saw in the last slide, there's still going to be over 1.2 million Californians, mostly immigrants without legal status, who will be uninsured. And so there's 11 billion in funding for community health centers for clinics, um, roughly 1 billion in California, and as you see, three quarters of all visits to those clinics are made by people of color, the uninsured or indigent, um, mostly paid for through the counties. And much of that is in LA County. We can talk a bit more about that in the Q&A. And finally, the, um, 
and it's a, again a really important and a bit of a good news, bad news scenario. California is the first uh, state after the ACA was passed to, to create a, a health benefit exchange. And what is a health benefit exchange? It's really simply a kind of insurance market, an insurance store where you get subsidized coverage in <coughs> the private market. And so if we look at the numbers that are expected, um, over 3 million Latinos, almost a million Asians, half a million African Americans are going to be eligible for private subsidized coverage. There are already are exchanges up and running, very different ones in Massachusetts, um, where it's much more comprehensive, in Utah, where it's more like an Expedia for health, where you can go and compare different products. And this exchange raises, which is politically very important because it bridges that gap between low and middle income folks that Mark was talking about and the other panelists will, will, will speak to as well. Enormous numbers of questions, though, about an exchange. And they are all the field of dreams questions. If you build it, will they come? Who will come? Because if you get um, only expensive folks in the exchange, it won't work. If you don't get enough people in the exchange, um, insurers won't want to offer affordable products, and it won't work. There's also a provision I mentioned very briefly in the Affordable Care Act because we're covering, we're spanning the globe in seven to eight minutes, called the Basic Health Plan, which has been a topic of discussion in Sacramento. And that would cover, uh, instead of an exchange, that would cover folks up to 200% of poverty um, in a different program. The pros there, you can still have continuity of care, you go to your site provider network. The negatives, you draw off a lot of people who might already be in exchange and and that would create its own issues. And finally, a couple of things in the ACA that are, that are being supported in California that are extremely important. The ACA, through the exchange and through other mechanisms, and again, this is very important, I think, for folks in the asset field, it simplifies the application for insurance tremendously, or should do it if everything works well. Through the exchange, um, the, the it's tasked to determine eligibility for public programs. And a couple of bills in Sacramento, uh, particularly AB 1296, carried by Bonilla, deepen this framework by the ACA by establishing a single standardized application form for Medi-Cal Healthy Families Exchange and County Programs. Important in its own right, and very easy to see how that could be affordable to the currently fragmented uh, services provided by counties even beyond health. And finally, um, I hope we can talk about this more in Q&A. The ACA is a bit of an entering wedge to looking at the social determinants of health, prevention, and public health. It doesn't stop at insurance coverage as important as that is. There are the grass shoots in this prevention and public health fund and community transformation grants to try to get at the, the, the bigger reasons why people are healthy or unhealthy. And it's my hope that there's a reciprocal back and forth between those in the assets field and the health field um, in thinking about these issues. Um, I was very struck earlier this year that Thomas Frieden, the head of the Centers for Disease Control, gave a speech in which he talked about the earned income tax credit actually as a vehicle for making people more healthy in the community and research that is being done that suggested that those who uh, participated in the EIT, EITC actually end up with better health outcomes. So hopefully, we will find here at the end the missing link between our two fields and move uh, forward together from there. Thank you. Thank you.
education, and health. Uh, policies to make it easier for low-income families to build their savings and their assets over their lifetime. And we look for those key moments in people's lives where they can build assets. This year, as I mentioned, we partnered with our, with our health program. And so through research and through um, legislation, we advanced this agenda. And you have it in your packets before you, the various uh, pieces of um, the bills that were moving through the legislative process. And of these 11 bills that we were advancing with the broad array of partners in Sacramento, six of them are on the governor's desk. Now, we had mentioned the health bill. And so what I want to do is I want to focus on the, um, the key financial empowerment strategies that we're using to leverage this health wealth agenda. Um, and I'm going to discuss it in three key ways. So the first, of course, is integrating existing asset building policies into state programs. The second is tapping into the Earned Income Tax Credit and other tax credits that are available to low and middle-income workers. And the third is partnering with the state's uh, Assets Coalition. It's the first EITC and Assets Coalition in the state. And so the reason we've been doing this work is because we know that the need is great. Um, for many of us, we were not shocked when we read the census numbers that came out to say that uh, poverty is at historic highs that about 6 million Californians are now living in poverty. But when we think about poverty from an income perspective, it only tells part of the story. And us in the asset building field believe that it's really just a tip of the iceberg in trying to understand economic security of families throughout this country. That what we should really be looking at is asset poverty. Um, and in California, 30% of households are asset poor, meaning they would not be able to survive for three months at the poverty level if they were to lose their job or experience a medical emergency. So asset poverty, of course, is more consequential. And so we are working to advance these initiatives and these strategies to make it easier for families to build their assets. Um, and uh, as with the, with the historic passage of health care reform, as we've mentioned, um, and the expansion of health coverage, um, we know, as uh, Mark said, that one of the key reasons why families were filing in bankruptcy prior to the foreclosure crisis was not so bad, and that uh, millions of Californians are still dealing with medical debt now. Um, so that there are these key initiatives that are going to expand much needed services um, and resources uh, to needy families. But, um, but that there are also existing programs. And at a time now when, when at, at all levels of governance, um, we see uh, uh, not enough dollars there uh, to, uh, to be able to expand on these programs, we should ensure that they're working as efficiently as possible and they're working for working families. And so with that, we believe that it's a great time again to integrate these asset building uh, programs into the Bank on California program, the Scholar Share program, the CaliWorks program, the CalFresh program, and tax time savings programs that exist at the state level. In 2008, we helped Governor Schwarzenegger launch Bank on California. Now, Bank on California was the first state effort to help unbanked and underbanked the residents in California open up starter accounts, savings accounts. And for many of the bankers here, you've all been partners, many of you, in helping to expand Bank on initiatives and Bank on efforts. Uh, these starter accounts are key and important because without a bank account, it's going to be nearly impossible for a low-income individual to build their savings. They'll constantly be relegated to using fringe products and services that charge exorbitant fees for something as simple as paying their, uh, their bills and cashing their paycheck. And so in 2008, Governor Schwarzenegger launched Bank on California. And since then, there are now about five states throughout the country and 70 cities throughout the country that have launched Bank on efforts um, to, uh, to, to spur these starter accounts and bring low-income uh, consumers into the mainstream, into the financial mainstream. Now, these bank on programs work really, really well in communities where there are existing banks and credit unions. But in communities where there are no banks, there are, we cannot launch these bank on initiatives because they work in partnership with existing financial institutions. And so what the Bank on California program could do is integrate the Banking Development District program. And the Federal Reserve, uh, the Broadway Federal Bank, and Foresi uh, Holding Mole, CFI here in Los Angeles, have been very supportive of the Banking Development District program where uh, the states and, uh, and local entities would make uh, local and state deposits available to financial institutions that agree to open up in communities where there are no banks or credit unions and agree to develop products and services that are tailored to the needs of low-income consumers. 
Now this has worked in New York State since 2002, and we believe that it can also work here in the state of California, and spur more bank bonds. Now, as a first step, Governor, uh, Governor Brown is actually considering um, AB 28, which is Assembly Bradford legislation. He's a legislator from here in Los Angeles. And AB 38 to basically require the Department of Financial Institutions to map out the state of California and provide legislators with a roadmap of where these communities are so that they could have targeted incentives um, and, um, and come out um, with, uh, with a clear plan of how they're going to execute a banking development district program um, that strategically meets the needs of these communities throughout the states. But when it comes to saving, uh, we've mentioned that tax time uh, with the earned income tax credit, we believe, is the ideal time to get low-income families to save. Um, Governor Schwarzenegger also uh, signed legislation in 2006. He actually signed the split refund legislation. It's a bill that allows taxpayers in California to split their refund into a checking account or a savings account. Uh, but the split refund option that makes it easy for folks to save right on their tax form is just the beginning. Um, we hope that the administration will consider is allowing tax filers to roll a refund into an existing college savings uh, account um, all in one fell swoop right on their tax form. Uh, and, uh, and I'm working with the Franchise Tax Board to try to help make this happen. Um, and, uh, and we're also looking at um, ways to continue to spur college savings. I just have the one minute mark, and I can't believe I've been up here for six minutes. Seriously? <laughs> Has it felt like six minutes to you? <laughs> Say no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, four more minutes. Um, so, <laughs> um, and so we, we developed these systems to try to make tax time the ideal time, but to make tax time the ideal time to save for various goals. Um, and we believe that college savings is one of those goals. And so by making it easier for folks to roll their refunds into an existing 529 plan, I um, think that that's an easy way uh, for families to be able to do so. And are also looking at ways to eliminate the current barriers for low-income families to participate in 529 college savings plan. Um, because know that low-income families are not participating at the rate that they should be in the state of California. And also know that college savings is key to get our kids college bound. Uh, because research shows that children who have college savings, regardless of their income, are seven times more likely to go to college than kids that don't have college savings. Um, now, I'm going to move on over really, really quickly uh, to, uh, to just elaborate a little bit more on this EITC because it also impacts Angelinos. Um, we had a report last year that came out um, titled Left on the Tables. And what we found was that uh, low-income Californians are not tapping into much-needed resources. And the EATC, um, we're, about, we're leaving um, over $1 billion of unclaimed tre uh, credits in DC coffers. And that's $1 billion that can go into low-income families' pockets. About 800,000 Californians are not tapping into this much-needed resource. And here at LA County, is one of the largest counties in our study that's leaving these EITC dollars on the table. And that's money that goes directly into the pocket of low-income Californians, and, is, uh, and it, it helps to stimulate local economies. Um, and so with the, with the support of various coalitions out there and in partnership with the Pathways Initiative that Senator Carol Lou from Los Angeles launched, um, we're working with, um, with various partners to highlight um, the, uh, the work that's happening by nonprofits, religious groups, business organizations throughout the state uh, to conduct media outreach and get folks to tap into this much needed credit. Um, again, uh, the data is, is clear, the numbers out there are stark, and in communities of color, we know that they're hurting even more. And at many times, it feels like it's, it's daunting to be able to, to really overcome and, and, uh, and tackle these challenges. But the good news is that California um, has various partners out there that have come together collaboratively and have launched a statewide assets in the ITC coalition. Um, this is a coalition that is made up of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Citibank, um, the, the Office of Financial Empowerment in San Francisco, AERP, Catholic Charities, the Greenlighting Institute, the New America Foundation, who are uh, founding members. Um, and the coalition is actually going to be having its second uh, annual gathering, a symposium here in Los Angeles on November 15th. And I encourage you all to attend. It will happen here in LA. Uh, and uh, they'll be highlighting many of these health and wealth initiatives uh, to build broader support and raise greater awareness of the promise and potential of these policies. And with that, I'll close. Thanks so much.
Let's start with Lucy. Is that Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so um, again, my name is Jose Quiñones, I'm the Executive Director of Region Asset Fund. I know I have seven minutes, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. Uh, I, and, but I, I, I must say that, you know, Mark's and, and, and Lee's presentation kind of left a little bit bummed up. I mean, very depressing day then. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, I'm not <laughs> personal at all, but you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of a daunting issue, right? You know, talking about uh, debt, medical debt specifically. And then from, uh, from my perspective as a, as a nonprofit organization working with immigrants, you know, it, it's sort of overwhelming to sort of think about all the different difficulties and problems that, that you know, local of families have to face. And, uh, and so, so thanks for that. I really appreciate that. Um, but, you know, what, what we do in, in, in the Mission District is particularly, you know, focused on, on working with low-income uh, immigrant families, trying to get them, you know, transition them into the financial industry. That's our purpose. And so we've done that through a number of different you know, innovative programs and services to try to help immigrants, particularly people that have no checking accounts or savings accounts or even no history, even credit histories, and to kind of get them more and more into the financial mainstream so that they can actually use the financial products and services so that they can build their wealth over time. That's the idea. And the Mission District, uh, just to give you a quick note of, 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 of the daunting problems that we face, is that about 44% of Mission households that have no credit history, that have no credit scores. In China, I just to give an example in the mission, I mean, in San Francisco as well, was a, that number was more about like 56% of the uh, Chinatown households have no credit history. So without a credit history, without a credit report, it is impossible to, you know, ask the kids to do anything economically. Without that, you can't get a loan to buy a car, a loan to start up a business, a loan to do anything. And I mean, you know, in some cases, you can't even get an apartment with a credit report on it. And, and, and now, you know, even to get a job, you need a credit history. So, so what we've done is to sort of tackle that problem by, you know, by building again some that's a innovative program. But I don't want to get into all of those right now because it's a whole different conversation. But one of the things that we um, that we did do is to sort of say, well, from the perspective of the client, of the consumer, of the person, you know, what is it that they have that we can use to build, them, right? You know, from the perspective of where the clients are at, we say, well, where are they, so that that way we can then build or help them move into this through the continuum from where they're at, not where we want them to be, where we think they should be, but more or less where the way they're at. Those are like basically the two principles that we've sort of uh, used to develop all of our, our, our program and services. Now I say those now because you know they're actually what led us to to what we um, that what I'm talking to talk to you about today about the financial tax labels. So one of the things that we did was that to sort of say, well, you know, as we preparing individuals to the financial mainstream, you know, we also realized that it wasn't just enough to kind of, you know, get people a checking account. It wasn't enough to get them to start a credit, you know, credit history. That we that they needed some tools, you know, and, and products to help them navigate the financial mainstream. Because as you know, the financial, you know, marketplace is is, is pretty rife with a lot of you know bad players. You know, they're, they're just out there ready to take out the, the assets or savings that we've helped people accumulate. So what we did in the Mission District, and some of you guys have been there, um, we actually went and, and did like a little shipper shopper survey where we went to this. There's 57 financial service institutions in the Mission. The Mission is a really small community, by the way. It's like about a one or two mile radius. So, so it's really small. So on Mission Street, there were actually more payday lenders than, was, than there were uh, uh, black gold stands. <laughs> Really, taquerias, or let me just be clear about it. There's a lot of other restaurants, of course, but more pay than others that work like taquerias in the mission. So what we did was we kind of went through all those the institutions and we had the very basic question, like, how much does it cost to borrow a thousand dollars, right? I mean, how much does it cost, right? And we wanted to know, so we wanted to all of these financial institutions with that question in mind and then we took information about that. So at the end of that, the, the, the survey, we had like this long spreadsheet, you know, Excel sheet, beautiful, a lot of information, and then we were like, well, what do we do with this information? Because you know, how do we use this information that we just gathered and to help our clients, our you know, mission residents, to basically be better financial consumers? So, so we asked the question: Well, what do they do with information? How do they actually receive information? And at this point, we started looking at different sort of models of how consumers receive information about complicated things, like the things that actually are you know, the stuff that we eat, right? And so, the past twenty years, the nutritional facts label has been one of those sort of like. The, the sort of key models that, that you know that we have uh, you know, used to you know to you know inform the consumer so they can make good uh, I mean, good uh, decisions. 
I mean, you know, as you might have noticed, like even on, on um, you know, on medications or things like that, we now are seeing drug facts. You know, and it's sort of like a very simple, you know, label, no, you know, bells or whistles. This is a very simple sort of information to, again, to inform consumers. So we basically then took like, the, the concept that, well, if we take what we gather in terms of like, you know, how much it costs about $1,000 and try to present that to our clients in a way that they actually make, you know, resonate with them, then this is what we came up with. And what we call the financial facts label. The financial facts label was the idea that, that as we, for, for, for borrowers, consumers to make good financial decisions for themselves, they needed to know what it is that they were getting, right, in terms of a loan, in a personal loan, in this case, $1,000. And what, what, what made this, you know, uh, very, you know, true, I mean, uh, kind of like a tool that, that, that made sense you know, from a nutritional uh, facts perspective is that we realized that, you know, that the nutritional facts label was based on this idea of 2,000 calories, right, the daily count. Well, we realized that those 2,000 calories were really nothing more than a budget of 2,000 calories, right? So that when you eat something that is five, you know, 500 calories, you know, basically they're telling you, hey, by the way, if that's 25% of your 2,000 calorie budget for today, right? And so we thought, well, what is the equivalent of a, on a financial standpoint? And then we came up with the concept of monthly debt budget. You can't really see it really well in this colors or projects for that, but but the percent of the uh, of monthly debt budget was sort of like our metric that we kind of came, came up with to sort of say, well, there's some parallel <coughs> in between what we eat, you know, in, in this product and what we're actually getting in an actual particular loan. So, so that, that way we can very easily, very quickly communicate to bars before they take our loans to sort of say, hey, can you actually afford this? If you cannot afford this because you're already over your budget, maybe you shouldn't take out another loan. Maybe you should wait another month, two months. So that that way you can start paying down some of your debt. So this is you know the basic principle. Of course, a lot of other ideas there. Uh, you know, it's totally based on, on the concept of that that people should probably very knowledgeable because I attach myself to issues that are uh, where entire communities are collectively learning, and we had a tremendous amount of learning in this morning's panel, and I, I look forward to the same um, in, in this panel. Um, we have with us today uh, three, uh, three people who really take some of those policy frameworks we talked about this morning and activate them on the ground and innovate upon them. Uh, and so we're going to go in a slightly different order even on the agenda, but uh, Rochelle reyes Banker is going to lead us off from Catholic Healthcare West. That's one of the largest safety net hospitals in the nation that has had a long-term commitment to uh, um, a range of philanthropy and other organizations that help communities, particularly those that are marginalized, uh, realize uh, better health outcomes. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Lynn Yonakura, who is um, the uh, Director of Community Benefit at California Hospital Medical Center of Foundation, which is a Catholic Healthcare West Hospital. Uh, Lynn, as many of you know, is also the Executive Director of LAS Babies Network, one of the remarkable innovative programs we have here um, in Los Angeles County to help ensure better health outcomes. And then we'll hear from Forrest C. Hogan Rolls, who runs a community development financial institution, or CDFI, uh, in Los Angeles that has for uh, well over, what, two decades by now, um, provided um, a range of um, savings, asset buildings, and credit products to uh, uh, low-income and otherwise under, uh, underserved families and individuals and entrepreneurs, uh, and she'll talk about how that work is, um, uh, that you're reframing it, where they focus on building assets and building healthy communities and healthy households. Uh, so we'll leave Dr. Rochelle. Thank Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, still kind of recovering from a cold here, so I apologize if uh, um, some coughing comes along. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I'm so happy to be here today. I uh, am uh, pinch hitting for Pablo Bravo, who is our director of community investment programs. When he told me about this opportunity, I couldn't really pass it up because one of the main things about my job is to be able to tell our uh, 
story, our CHW story, and, and the work that we do in the communities that we serve. And so I, I'm so honored just to be here and to be a part of the learning and the discussion going forward. About CHW, um, it is uh, our mission to deliver compassionate, high quality, affordable health care services. Uh, we, we exist to serve and ad advocate for our sisters and brothers who are poor and disenfranchised and we partner with others in the community to improve the quality of life. This is essentially the core of who we are. And when it comes to uh, our values, there are five that we absolutely um, look to to guide us in everything that we do, and that's dignity, respecting the inherent value of work of every individual, collaboration without our ability to work together with other people to support common values and vision. I don't think we would be in existence today. Uh, justice, that is so central to our sponsoring congregations, uh, the healing ministry. We advocate for social change and act in ways that promote respect for all persons and demonstrate compassion for our sisters and brothers who are powerless. And stewardship, that is such a huge <laughs> Uh, value of ours, I think without our ability to be able to take care of the resources that is entrusted to us, we wouldn't be able to provide the services that uh, that our communities look to us for. So we cultivate these resources uh, to promote healing and wholeness, and lastly, excellence. Well, we are always striving for excellence. It, it's always um, good to know that uh, there's humility involved every step of the way, too, that we are here to try to um, expectations through teamwork and innovation. I always like to start off with our mission and our values because as I tell my 10-year-old son, you know, Tristan, when things are kind of looking a little crazy out there, when there are things that don't make sense and where sometimes it feels like, um, you know, things around you are hurting, it's always good to know who you are and what you're about. And so I start off with our uh, mission and values keep us grounded in this conversation. So a little bit more about um, CHW. Uh, I, I don't know if you know we are spread out in California, Arizona, and Nevada. We've got 40 hospitals, um, most of which are in California. We're the fifth largest healthcare system in the nation and the largest private not-for-profit healthcare system in California, and also the largest Medi-Cal provider in the state. Uh, we have over, uh, well, close to 9,000 acute care beds. Um, I know now we've got employees that are over 60,000. And in terms of community benefits and care for the poor, uh, we've provided $1.3 billion. Now, this includes traditional charity care, shortfalls from government-funded programs, including Medicaid and Medicare, and other uh, uh, proactive programs for the poor and, and the broader community. Now, it's important to say that CHW's commitment to healthcare reform has been steadfast. In fact, um, since our founding in 1986, I want to say that our, our, um, our focus on healthcare reform is probably the reason why we came together as a system. Originally, we were seven healthcare systems uh, from seven different sponsoring congregations, and we came together knowing that we could do more uh, in the communities that we serve if we do it together. Um, because in the 80s, as you know, it was uh, quite a trying time for healthcare systems in general, and we knew we had to do something different. We had to uh, stay focused on our mission while being also relevant to uh, the times of, of the day. And so we, um, we very much, uh, would, we were very devoted to um, advocating for the passage of ACA. Even within the Catholic healthcare family, let's just say, uh, there was quite a split about whether to um, support ACA going forward or not. And uh, with much uh, discernment and uh, focus on our mission and our values, we knew that the right thing to do was to weigh in in support of ACA and to move it forward. Our leadership is very, very committed to successfully seeing uh, to the implementation of healthcare reform. and so. Uh, we have been very, very active uh, since its passage to see about um, how we can change our infrastructures, think about you know, ways in which we could do things differently, how we could partner with uh, folks um, uh, in, in the communities that we serve. So a little bit about um, what we are thinking about in terms of key strategies going forward. Um, 
we have developed our horizon in 2020. And we wanted to make sure, again, that we remain relevant and meaningful in the communities that we serve, that we remain viable, and that we continue to focus on these um, key areas in quality, in cost, in growth, in integration, in connectivity, and in leadership. Uh, in terms of quality, we are certainly looking to implement changes and initiatives that are necessary to raise CHW's clinical quality, patient safety, and service measures to top decile performance uh, nationally. Uh, we want to improve uh, uh, national patient safety goals. We wanna, uh, we're looking to reduce unnecessary admissions, and in fact, uh, we've been able to form an ACO-like organization in our Sacramento area to do just that. Um, partnering with health, health plans um, to serve health first uh, members, and we're already looking at tremendous uh, cost savings there as well as uh, 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 decreasing readmissions. We're looking to enhance the patient experience, reduce hospital required pressure ulcers, for example, improve evidence based medicine, uh, build out transformational care and implement chronic disease management. And uh, Lynn Yonakura, I know she's gonna be talking to you folks about um, what's really going on at the local level, and she's gonna animate some of these things that I'll be uh, talking about in, in broad strokes. Uh, in terms of looking at cost, we're already looking uh, at implementing changes in the CHW's clinical and administrative processes that lower CHW's cost below Medicare reimbursement levels. Uh, we're focused on improving uh, worker safety, uh, improving um, Medicare performance and clinical resources, uh, pursuing revenue services and strategic planning, uh, streamlining supply and purchase services, managing salary and benefit costs. In terms of growth, um, it's important that our healing ministry continues to expand um, access and market share within the service areas where we are. Um, and we are looking um, more and more to, uh, into entering new service areas and significantly expanding our uh, community-based wellness um, ambulatory and non-acute care services. It's important that we increase our return on assets, uh, grow commercial volume, prepare for the newly uninsured, uh, diversify non-acute uh, holdings, um, and again, uh, continually entering into new service areas where uh, where there is uh, greatest need. Now, integration is uh, uh, so very key to us uh, going forward. Um, we know that we can't operate in a silo. We've never been that way, and I don't think we'll stop ever looking to see how we might be able to come together with others to, to improve um, the way healthcare is delivered. Uh, because if we don't do that, we just know that healthcare going forward would not be sustainable if we don't try to work together to uh, uh, lower costs. So we're looking to offer our patients the full spectrum of care from prevention to post-acute through the development of health plan capacity. We're looking to build new partnerships, greater physician alignment, uh, and also um, many of our service areas are certainly looking at developing um, accountable care organizations. And through clinical integration, we're looking to uh, build new partnerships between physicians and other hospital systems with plans, um, improve our outcomes on hospital paper performance measures, and establish a, a very competitive um, uh, market across our service areas. Because we believe that that is uh, key in making sure that um, we can provide affordable care services going forward. Now, in terms of connectivity, um, we need our toys, you know, <laughs> and the way to go right now is really to make sure that our uh, electronic connectivity is, is up to par with um, what the needs are of physicians, of patients, of nurses, of, of all the caregivers that are uh, involved. We're really looking to achieve superior service um, experiences and high quality outcomes, and we're going to need to do this um, by uh, certainly investing uh, and expanding in, in electronic health records, um, implementing physician electronic medical records and connectivity, implementing enterprise data strategies, uh, and again, increasing patient connectivity is, is probably the most important because we need to give the tools uh, to those who are the consumers of healthcare, and, and so we need to be able to uh, be able to provide that for them. Now, leadership obviously is key for us. I mean, our size. Matters, I know, um, 
as the largest healthcare, uh, private healthcare organization in California, uh, size means a lot to people, and size comes with a lot of responsibility, and leadership is about that responsibility. Uh, we want to strengthen CHW as an organization through new investments in employees and in positions, play a more active role in public policy and advocacy. Um, in, in many ways, uh, we've um, done so much in, in the policy arena to move the ball forward, um, but I know that there's always more to be done. Uh, we are, are focused in continued development of a culture of innovation and collaboration, and we look to have a greater role uh, for our foundations um, in raising community funds to help build and maintain the uh, programs that we do have, and again, to continually look at you know, where the needs are and, and to rigorously focus on um, meeting those needs uh, in, in the communities that we serve. So as the nation begins the journey towards a more just healthcare system, um, CHW uh, takes seriously its leadership role in, in improving the quality of care that we deliver um, while also reducing costs. We know that uh, hospitals have such a, a heavy responsibility in um, leading that charge. I, I don't know how um, hospital systems uh, can continue to remain afloat if they don't uh, move with the tide and if they don't uh, make sure that um, not only acute care services are provided, but looking at the overall health of the community. So I think, so it, it's really important for uh, hospital leadership to uh, be in the game um, in, in, in leading that charge. Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention um, that uh, as we look at um, the implementation of ACA, I know that our system is very much um, uh, looking at um, innovative ways in which we can partner um, with other health plans and other uh, hospital systems. And as I mentioned earlier, our collaboration with um, Hill Physicians Medical Group in Blue Shield of California in the service area of Sacramento has been really, really um, fruitful and has been inspiring to other service areas that we are at. Uh, we've been able to see a 16% drop in readmission and about a $16 billion uh, cost savings uh, in that market alone. So uh, we, we hope that these uh, achieved um, results, uh, working together with our patients and our physicians and our health plans um, to deliver excellent uh, uh, care is moving in the right direction. And we know that when uh, we're providing the right care at the right time, uh, so much fruit uh, uh, comes from it. And, and we free up a lot more resources to be able to do the things that we need to do in the communities that we serve. So earlier, uh, Lynn had mentioned um, that uh, ACA is the bridge to the health wealth connection, and CHW certainly sees its role in all of that. Uh, we very much are in support of expanding health insurance coverage. Uh, that has <laughs> so much meaning to us um, because we know all too well um, how our patients our patients are, uh, suffer under this, and so we are uh, certainly moving in that direction to help uh, expand coverage. We're looking to improve uh, coverage quality and reducing medical debts. Um, streamlining eligibility is quite important. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, addressing the social determinants of health is, is primary for us. Uh, we not only provide acute care services, we've never been in the business of just doing that. We absolutely see you know, the responsibility that we have in being able to provide uh, community benefit programs and really looking at what the um, needs are and assessing those needs um, and uh, being able to uh, meet those needs through, through the programs that we do provide. Um, I will end with that. I hope that uh, we continue to work with you, to partner with you, keep us humble, keep us challenged, uh, let us know how we can better do the work that we're uh, entrusted to do uh, on behalf of all of our, the communities that we serve. And I, I look forward to questions that you might have later. And, and again, please, you know, if you don't know about CHW, go into any of our facilities, see what you could do to partner with us, go into our website and learn more about us. Thank you.
theory was put into practice. Unfortunately, the schools 
most of the schools are in the lowest performing uh, level. As Lisa told us at our last meeting in July, poverty in early childhood poisons the brain, and this is a fact. Um, and, um, you know, children are building uh, neurons, making synapses, making connections, um, hundreds uh, in a second. Uh, so those early, first three or four or five years are really critical in the life of, of children. And as she pointed out, uh, we tend to make uh, our investment in children late. Um, so, um, and we can see that uh, what's causing the problem about poverty, with poverty, is um, the amount of stress that children um, are under uh, when they're living in persistent poverty. And this results in a uh, reduction in their working memory uh, such that at the end, as they enter school, there's a six, they have a 60% lower cognitive performance um, on entrance exams uh, than their middle class peers, and uh, a deficit of about 30 million words. And then you consider the fact they're entering uh, low performing schools, uh, you can just imagine that this gap is going to continue to widen and that they're going to become very frustrated and they will drop out of school uh, around the end of middle school and it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy if nothing is done. We know what hurts and what helps. What hurts is this um, amount of stress from poverty uh, and its effect on brain development. Um, they also um, suffer from inadequate nutrition and health support. They live in unsafe, unstable homes, often moving frequently, sometimes being intermittently homeless. Um, they uh, lack language support, uh, and that's evidenced by their um, fewer words that they know when they enter uh, school. And a lot of the words that they hear are very negative. Um, what helps is uh, the provision of high quality early care and education, uh, good schools, and parent support groups. Um, they uh, safe and healthy communities uh, with strong infrastructure um, that we enjoy in middle class communities, obviously uh, good health. Um, and uh, doing cost benefit analysis is important so we can uh, document what works and convince uh, funders to uh, fund it. So, I can't cure poverty, um, you know, and I can't uh, create world peace. Uh, so we have to look at what works to promote health and healing, even in the face of tremendous challenge and risk. And what makes a child resilient uh, is um, being surrounded by caring uh, relationships, um, hearing high expectation messages uh, like Olivia talked about this morning, um, and uh, being given opportunities to uh, meet, uh, participate in a very meaningful way, not just, you know, um, to surface dressing, but really um, uh, having them participate and contribute um, to uh, the uh, good of others. So this just uh, gives you an overview of uh, a little bit more depth about caring relationships, high expectations, and opportunities for uh, participation uh, and contribution. And um, these are themes that I will come back to as I progress through the rest of the slides quickly. Um, we deliver approximately 5,000 babies every year at California Hospital. And um, our question was, back in 1992, how do we optimize the life course trajectory of each baby that's born in our hospital? If I spend um, eight, seven or eight months working closely with a mother with a high-risk pregnancy and she has a good outcome, um, both she and the baby are 
healthy at the end, um, that's great. But not if it just falls off a precipice into back into the community where there are no, no supports for that family. And at that time, Pico Union had no uh, rural services. Uh, in fact, it had so few services, the Department of Children and Family Services couldn't even create a, a community service directory for it because there weren't enough services to list. Um, so that was our starting point. And we uh, aimed at um, uh, starting um, an, or an organization going to turn into a recording soon, um, that is focused on enhancing the overall development of children, strengthening the economic self-sufficiency and stability of families, uh, much in the way that you do, but a little bit different perspective, um, and enhancing the community service delivery system for young children and families, because that's what we have in our community. Importantly, the underlying philosophy of Hope Street is uh, based on mutual respect, partnership, partnership with other agencies, partnerships with the families, um, et cetera, and an understanding that in order for an agency like Hope Street to truly serve the community, it must not only listen, but also allow itself to be actively guided by the voices within. And indeed, the parents uh, are uh, an, the administrative body that uh, controls Hope Street, and um, they do the hiring and firing. They go over the budget of the um, whole organization uh, every, uh, every year. So we nested Hope Street at a hospital with a busy birthing uh, facility. And I think that makes a lot of sense because um, that's where, the, where lives are starting. And we wanted to get them early uh, so that we could intervene uh, and uh, offer early intervention if necessary um, and early support uh, as well. So these. Um, on the inner circle are the primary uh, pro um, programs of Hope Street, and on the outer circle are just a few of our many uh, partner agencies. And um, just, I'm going to uh, just give you a quick overview. Um, in blue are all the home visitation programs. Um, home visitation programs may start during pregnancy and continue for a variable number of years, uh, depending on the particular uh, program. We have three child development centers. Uh, there are high quality, full day uh, programs so the parents have the ability then to go to work or go back or go to school and know their children are receiving high quality care in their absence. Um, one is at the hospital, one is at a four, nested in an affordable housing uh, uh, um, place across the street in Mercy Housing, and one is at a church, an Angelica Lutheran Church in the midst of Pico Union. We focus on a lot of literacy uh, because literacy, as you know, is linked to health outcomes very closely. And so we have family literacy, school readiness programs. Of course, Early Head Start is, is itself a literacy program. We have a continuation high school classroom in the hospital, one of the first three in the United States with a 90% graduation rate. And um, we have behavioral health programs to maintain the mental health of family members, uh, responsible fatherhood program, um, and a um, a healthy marriage program that teaches couples how to really uh, communicate in a very healthy way uh, between each other, um, and then it goes from the family but out into the community, and we populate a lot of school boards with our, uh, with our parents as well. So this gives you an overview, and um, in the slides are a lot more um, in-depth uh, descriptions of these various um, programs, that the goal is to provide 
uh, children get those three opportunities that we talked about so that they grow up resilient. And um, families are uh, given control. They set their own goals uh, that they work on throughout the year. Uh, and so the locus of control is internal to the family and not external uh, by our agency. Thank you. Thank you. in the domain of community development, uh, that, that the things that they're doing, looking out for the programs that they're associated with, are uh, ones that we have financed in the field of community development over the years. Uh, and so there's, a, uh, there's an integration of two fields, in some senses, going on here, uh, with a great deal of promise for preempting problems and containing costs. Um, and uh, Forestie, Hogan and Wells will come at it from the other side, from the community development side, where uh, her organization is diversifying its products to um, create a platform for better health among its uh, residents and businesses. Thank you. And you can just turn this off. Uh, you may cheer right now because I did not bring slides. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is bridge the gap, and I'm happy to do that, uh, because uh, it's important uh, to really talk clearly about uh, the work that we do as a wealth creation, transformation of lives, strategy, and what health care and healthy food and all of those components mean to bring them together. So I have a couple of stories for you. I know we, you said we have 10 minutes, so I'm going to do two minutes of my stories to prepare you and then eight minutes on the work that we're doing in partnership with the California Endowment and us, hopefully some other investors that we're working with around uh, what's now being called food deserts. So uh, one is uh, my husband and I were very uh, blessed to have uh, legally adopted our two grandchildren. One is five years old. Uh, we did this uh, three years ago when they were two and three years old because she was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. So Trinity is developmentally delayed and goes to a special school and does all the things that special kids do. You know? So she doesn't necessarily like fruit. Uh, she spits it out, and uh, but she loves uh, you know sweet potato fries, right? And her her brother is for no delays at all. In fact, he's as smart as a whip. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because a child at Trinity School uh, died uh, about a week and a half ago, and the doctors diagnosed it as he's nine years old. He died from obesity. Uh, they are very clear and know that the parent was feeding this child, his son. Uh, three times a day, Burger King. I'm not calling out Burger King, but the bottom line is he had breakfast, lunch, and dinner at Burger King. We knew this child. And I would always, I would see him and I'd say, why is he, what's wrong with him? And they, the staff would say, you know, we keep trying to tell his mother, you know, that they should try to feed him differently. That's a point that just happened within the last couple of weeks, nine years old. Second thing is, uh, when I was in Brazil uh, several years ago, so many people say, yeah, in Brazil. Uh, what I'm going to say this to you for is not because I went, but because of what I've witnessed and experienced when I went. And when you're walking on the beach, if you've been there, you know this. When you're walking on the beach along Copacabana Beach, there are not options to buy Coca-Cola. There's not options to buy hamburgers. You know what the options are? You can get at a food cart fresh fruit water, mango, watermelon, uh, uh, honeydew melon waters, and they're fabulous. Uh, you can get fruit on a stick, you can get grilled meats, and you can walk along the beach. Completely different, so the mindset is different. And so we weren't, I never, I had, I was there two, 10 days, I never had Coca-Cola, because it wasn't an option. And then the third thing is capitalism breeds greed. And, and I love capitalism, because that's where we live and that's where I was raised on, right? But I think there's a mindset shift that has to happen when we start to talk about food, and this will get me to my point, food deserts. You know, frankly, you know, I've really been thinking about that, and that terminology really did not resonate with me uh, when it started, and I'll tell you why, because there's plenty of food in the, in, the, in the communities that we serve. In fact, there's so much bad food that it's not a food desert. In fact, it's a food mania, because you've got all kinds of food. I mean, I was thinking about this, and I've been thinking about it a long time, when we started to come up with what does it mean to be working in an area 
uh, and CFRC will be 20 years old next year. We started briefly after the riots in 1992, and it was a, it was a, it was a, a tripartite partnership between the financial institutions, Bank of America, Wells Fargo at the time, San Juan Bank was around, they've now been purchased by Bank of the West, I could go on. But 39 banks helped to start CFRC to respond to these unmet credit needs and the disenfranchisement that happened within low-income communities, particularly South LA and East LA. Uh, the City of Los Angeles and the Federal Reserve Bank led the effort. And, you know, even then, I don't know if you remember the data, but one of the challenges that came out of RLA, which was Rebuild LA, was that in low-income communities, there's only one grocery store for every 50,000 people. That was what started this whole thinking around food deserts, you know, lack of access to good food, blah, blah, blah. And you fast forward that to now, and, and the other side of that statistic was in affluent communities, there's one grocery store for every 25,000 people. So you have double the number of stores for fewer people. The other thing that was important was when you started to look at where the restaurant types of restaurants were in low-income communities, specifically South LA, East LA, that's where people were doing all the research because that's where the riots really happened. If you found that there were one restaurant for every 15 to 20,000 families, and in more affluent communities, there are 10 restaurants to 20 restaurants for every 10 to 15, 20,000 families. So you have much greater variety and a broad brush of opportunities to get the kinds of food that you want. So that fast forwards me to now. The reason I'm, I'm concerned about that is food desert means that there's no food or that it's just a lack of food. Well, I think we have to change that mindset to there's a, a good food desert. And I think we have to redefine what good means, or healthy. You know, what I find when you say people, Eat the healthy option. You have, you know, uh, I think that I was watching a McDonald's uh, summary on, on one of these uh, CNN news channels or something a couple of weeks ago in a hotel, and I was sitting there going, you're kidding me. Uh, McDonald's has found that parents, even though they have this healthy food option with the apples and you dip it in the caramel sauce, that, that the parent, I know it's really healthy, um, that the parents are still ordering the french fries because the kids are in the back seat yelling, french fries, french fries. So there's this mindset that I'd much rather have the french fries than the apples, right? So it, there's this thinking, this mindset distinction that has to happen. And so I'm wondering how is it that as a capitalistic society, we give more time and more commercials and more advertising to fast food restaurants than we do public service announcements that advocate healthy food and healthy choices. So that's one thing. So in the midst of trying to figure out how does wealth creation, and you saw the statistics that came up from Dr. Lin, and by the way, that made me depressed. Because <laughs> I was going, oh great, you know, we don't have enough money to do what we need to do in our community even though we know it works. I mean, it, we, we constantly have this data that demonstrates that when people have jobs, that when people are running their own businesses, that they have health, and when they have health insurance, and they can take their kids where they need to go on a regular basis, that they're healthier, happier, and you have a healthier community. Yet we still fight the battle of getting funding into nonprofit organizations. I'm not just advocating for mine. Into nonprofit organizations that do the work that we know that works. You know, I, I remember when they cut, when the federal government cut the budget for health uh, for a Head Start. I go, well, what the heck? Everybody knows Head Start works. People get a meal, the kids are, are trained, and they are educated, they do well throughout high school, they go to college. We have all this data. So what does it mean for an organization like CFRC to be getting into health food? We, we, we didn't just get into this realm. What we've done is we've formed it in a way that I think transforms what we do into the healthcare world. And by the way, I have to say right now that health, health, Catholic Healthcare was say hi to Pablo for me. They were early investors in our, in our micro-lending program about 10 years ago. Uh, and for a healthcare organization to do that showed, I think, a lot of foresight on their part about how those two things mesh together. And so what we did was last year, uh, CFRC actually for the past three years has been involved in an initiative uh, discussion with California Endowment called the Healthy Food, Healthy Communities Initiative. And South LA is one target point. And so uh, I was attending those meetings with my economic development hat on. Uh, our organization was one of the few economic development focused organizations, uh, while the other 50 folks in the, in the room were social services, and we kept going, what are you talking about? 
These people need jobs. That's why they don't have health care. These people need jobs. That's why they're not happy. They, people need to work because as human beings, our self-worth is connected to what we do. And you're sitting around, I think it was one of, in your slides, there's this depression that happens and you're not healthy and you're not working and you're not having to sleep in a closet and you're out there and you've got sunshine and you've got a healthy environment, that makes you feel good. And so I came up with this thought that maybe there's some relationship between job creation and healthy food, right? And so as we were talking, uh, fast forward to uh, this concept uh, about street vendors. And I don't know if you've seen the street vendors, it reminded me very much of what was happening in Brazil. You could go down the street and buy some healthy food. You can actually buy healthy food on the streets of a low-income community in Los Angeles. Uh, most of the food vendors that are out there are selling fruit, if you've noticed, right? Or they're selling tacos, or uh, I saw a food vendor on Crenshaw and 54th the other day selling gumbo. You know, so, I mean, these, these folks are out there selling healthy, good food. And so, uh, how do we get them uh, into the mainstream society with good health licensing that's been, you know, they have a public health license, they learn good uh, food preparation techniques because they've gone to the classes that we get them, uh, you know, licensed with small business licenses, and if they need a loan, then we give that to them. And they earn that because they do the work to get there. And so we came up with this street, uh, street vending cart initiative. It's the first one. Uh, it's called Healthy Food Cart Vending Initiative. And it's the first one funded by the California Endowment. They recently funded it last December. We're coming up on our first year. And what we've done is we've formalized the work that we've done as an organization uh, in micro lending to focus in on uh, food vendors that are working on the streets in the evenings, during the daytime, uh, to really sell to meet the needs of their family. And asking them would they like to become formalized and encouraging them to do that. Uh, and one real uh, uh, encouraging note for them to do this is that there's not a food policy in the city of Los Angeles that allows for street vendors. So a lot of them get arrested. And they get taken in by the police. And even though you know they're not doing anything uh, that would be detrimental to society, they are breaking the law. So we have a number of cases, even the guy uh, who sells at the corner of uh, King and Figueroa, uh, my staff goes over there and buys food from him sometimes, and you know every couple of months he comes up missing, and we go, oh, he must have gotten arrested, you know, and it's true. Uh, he'll come back and he'll say, oh, they arrested me, and you know they should stop that, they should get the criminals, and they should. And so one of the par part of the work that is being funded uh, by the endowment is for CFRC to begin the process again, if you will. Uh, we actually about ten years ago worked with the city of LA to do a street vending uh, initiative uh, citywide. It was a two-year uh, pilot project, and then the money uh, fell apart and the funding went away, and so there's no uh, street vending uh, uh, policy for the city of LA. Although when you go to Chicago, New York, Washington, DC, there are in other major cities. So uh, we were funded a very small amount to begin the advocacy work around a citywide policy. I'm hoping it can go countywide and hopefully statewide, because I think that's something we have to work on. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we get our vendors uh, up to health code and up to uh, business code. Because th the thing about the work that we do, and I think this is important, and I'll end here, and I'm happy to take you and I'm trying to stick to my 10 minutes here, is that people think that micro loans and micro lending and street vendors and people that start a business with $500 don't make a difference. Uh, we did our own, and we collect this data on a regular basis. We did an analysis of the uh, tax dollars paid uh, by CFRC micro borrowers from 2003 to 2007, a four year period. They paid $220,000 in city taxes alone during that period of time. The other very important piece is that we do individual development accounts. Savings, I think there was a lady over here that was talking about the savings earlier. We now have uh, our most recent data that demonstrates that we had 220 families saving from 2004 to 2008. They saved, uh, and the, the minimum contribution was $25 a month, right? And they could do more than that if they wanted. They saved $178,000 in that amount of time. So we know that it works. 
it's slow and building, but those wealth creation strategies allow people to get to a, a level of confidence, a level of uh, thinking that allows them to say, you know what, I can do this. My kids can go to school. I can go back to school. I can start a business, and I can make this work for me. So I'll end there. I, there's so much more I'd love to say. I look forward to hanging around and talking to you if you'd like to talk more about this, but I believe that this conversation has to continue because the, the, the work between uh, public and private sector around how we build our communities from the ground up starts here. Thank you. Thank you. So much. We have a very few moments for questions. Uh, and we'd love to hear from the, uh, from the audience. Yes, and please tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Michael Manigo. I'm with Bank of America. Um, question for Dr. Yanakura. Um, I was really fascinated by the Hope Street uh, framework that you shared with us and uh, was very curious about the genesis of the um, of, of creating that framework. What what caused it and how did it uh, flourish over time? Um, what caused it was, uh, again, my concern about what was going to hap happen to the babies that we delivered at our hospital, who went back to a community with little uh, in the way of support or resources. Uh, and we uh, really went to a lot of the local uh, thought leaders, uh, particularly uh, clergy in the community and um, ask them what they thought um, the community needed, what types of services, the types of programs, if any, uh, would be beneficial. And so, uh, and then later we also listened to all the families that were participating. Um, they were the ones, for example, who wanted us to start an after school youth program. Um, and at first we thought it was just going to be, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, extra arts and crafts and things like this uh, that they weren't getting in school. But then we did standardized reading tests on all the children and found out they were reading way below grade level. So we implemented a um, language arts mentoring program that was very efficient at um, bringing them up to grade level. They worked with their, uh, usually a community member. Um, it could be a, um, you know, now they're loft dwellers, but uh, <laughs> they weren't lost back then. Um, but uh, they were people that worked in the community that wanted to volunteer some time to mentor young children in reading, and um, they could uh, help the child bring their reading level up about uh, three grade levels in a year, which is very efficient, and um, because of the way the program was designed. And also, I should say that for this audience, that a uh, banker from San Juan Bank uh, created an incentive program for the children. So if they um, came to after school mentoring, um, they got points. If they um, improved their uh, um, report card, they got so many points. And they could um, save the points um, and um, purchase items from our cupboard, which mostly had school supplies, backpacks, you know, different types of things that um, school children need. Um, but the children learned um, that they could get um, immediate gra uh, gratification you know, and get something that's like a snack or they could begin to build their points and um, maybe get something really nice, you know, like a soccer ball. And um, so it's a way of teaching children sort of banking principles, if you will, um, but in a way that they could, young children particularly could understand. And um, I think the most touching time for me was when a young child said, well, he, he was going to say, because he had so many points and we couldn't figure out what he was doing. And he says, well, it's my mother's birthday. And so he was going to buy her a backpack. And uh, you know, he'd been saving all these points for that. We, we were also touched with the game of that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
but I think you know you, you need to listen. We feel you need to listen to the community uh, you're serving, and and they're wise, and we we are uh, focused on strengths and their internal assets, and uh, we build on those. We don't we don't embrace a deficit model. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, please. Um, interesting on the role. So there's been some. Um, a little bit of a it's maybe too soon to call it backlash, but there have been um, chain grocery stores, the regional, national chains, all sitting in a lot of cities in the country, New Haven, Seattle, Harlem. And I've talked to some of the senior executives at the store, Safeway, for instance. They, 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 they pointed out to me to their dismay that the take up of the good foods in the grocery stores and even the traffic in those stores hasn't been what they expected and wanted. Is that just a matter of time and commitment, um, or are there other factors involved? How, how do you respond to that if that's something that does seem to be happening? Well, I have to say, you know, in our in our communities, we haven't seen very many new stores come in, so I don't know if that's true. I think if they if they come, uh, in fact, we've seen a, a loss of stores. I, I've been watching this. Uh, Rouse, for instance, in South LA, has closed eight of its stores uh, over the past ten years. Uh, whereas only three new ones have opened, uh, and that would be the, the uh, warehousing stores, which of course senior citizens and smaller families don't like because you have to buy bulk, and then you, you know, waste a lot of it. So um, I don't know about uh, in other uh, cities as such. I did tour a uh, new grocery store in Harlem, but that was like five years ago, and as I recall, they were doing really well. But, you know, it could be a function of the economy, too. I mean, when you know, now that people are out of work and, you know, you don't have as much as disposable income, the first thing to go is, how can I limit my budget on food? I'm not going to buy a $3 apple that's an organic apple when I can buy one for a dollar on the corner and, you know, I can still feed my family. It may not taste as good. So that, that would be my thought. I might uh, leap in on that one um, as we wrap up and hand it back to Melody. Uh, you're probably familiar with the California Freshworks Fund which is a program spearheaded by the California down and another avenue that they're taking to work on this matter of um, what many call actually food swamps. Uh, and uh, the, uh, because that's relevant because even, even in the conventional grocery store you know, or and certainly in the corner stores that are uh, more commonly lower income communities you come in and the first products you see are the the cigarettes, the alcohol products, the candies, and so on. So part of um, the California Freshworks Fund uh, is a combination of regular bank financing, but then also some subordinated uh, mission-driven financing and grants, um, Capital Healthcare West being one of the uh, partners again in this venture. Uh, and that uh, blend of financing enables them to help the retailers uh, take on some product innovation as to how they place products in their stores in order to incentivize and motivate um, folks to come in and get the healthier foods. Many of the uh, supermarkets that uh, are the model for this program in the state of Pennsylvania, and the um, original Healthy Foods Financing Initiative, have uh, meeting rooms for community and space to learn about healthy foods. Some of them have kitchens so that you can get some healthy uh, cooking instruction. So I think we're at the very beginning of um, a revolution in how we per increase access and incentivize uh, healthy foods in, in lower income communities. Um, but I think that that illustrates the importance of various sectors working together, philanthropy, uh, in this case health systems, and their community benefits are, by the way, a huge resource for us to think about strategically. It's about $12 billion a year across all nonprofit health, um, uh, health systems in the country. And uh, the conventional uh, financial services are in there, where, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't help but think today, wouldn't it be nice if we had a Hippocratic oath in the financial services um, industry. Uh, uh, but what we see today and have heard about uh, are uh, instances where we take the tools of uh, credit and financial services and try to make them the basis for building assets and promoting health. Um, and I, I hope that all of us can continue talking after the formal end of today's session to figure out more ways to build on the successful models we've heard about today. And thank you, Melody, again for hosting us here. Thank you. We have just a couple of announcements. And then I'm going to ask uh, Olivia if she would uh, join.
join me uh, here and to close out the session today. Uh, so one of the first things I wanted to mention was, Lisa, do you want to say anything about the, the Robert Wood Johnson conference or your work in that area? And actually, it's Melody's vision that made this a morning symposium. Um, we uh, we approached uh, Melody to uh, to have this be the, the host um, for the LA event, but this is really a speaker series that the New America Foundation has launched with um, with an array of partners. And uh, and I welcome you to uh, if, you have, if you have contacts and colleagues and friends in uh, in Oakland or in Fresno, to please let them know that the symposium is coming their way. We're going to have a forum at the East Bay Community Foundation tomorrow uh, during the lunch hour, and then we'll be at Fresno State University um, on the 29th. So Oakland on the 28th and Fresno on the 29th, um, and we'll be talking about the specific health wealth disparities that. Uh, that those communities are experiencing, as well as local strategies to try to bridge the divide. Um, I also want to, Ivan Carrillo again, with the Office of Assemblyman Ricardo Lara, thank him for being here. Thank the Assemblyman, who's the chair of the Select Committee on Financial Empowerment, which is the first committee at any state house in this country that's focused on asset building and wealth preservation. It's a bipartisan Select Committee with seven members. Um, they represent all of California, and uh, they actually have their first hearing in Los Angeles in Southeast LA on August 18th, and they're going to be meeting again in San Francisco on October the 4th. Uh, so if you're in, in the Bay Area and want more information, get in touch with Juan Carrillo. Um, and then again, this, uh, this symposium is going to be on November the 15th. Hope to see you all there, um, and would be happy to, to make sure that the group gets the invitation. So thanks so much again for being here, and I look forward to continuing discussions. <laughs>